everybody, and welcome to AMC Mailbag, the all-mailbag show here on AMC Movie News, where all we do is take your questions. I'm Ashley Mova, and if you've got a question that you want answered on air, send it over anytime to amcmovietalk at gmail.com. You could get it answered on our daily show, AMC Movie Talk, or our weekend show, AMC Mailbag. And sitting with me to answer some of those questions is the editor-in-chief of AMC Movie News, John Campia. John, how are you today? Maybe I'm... As super as they are. We were just watching that Jeremy Renner video. It's so freaking great. I love it. Hey, everybody. Happy Sunday. Happy Sunday. All right. First question comes from Josiah Ward, and he writes, Hey, everyone at AMC Movie Talk. So it feels like almost every day there is a new Avengers movie clip released on YouTube. I haven't been watching them, but it feels like a good chunk of the movie is already out, but all out of context. Who exactly makes this decision, and does it annoy you as well? Well, you know, this actually kind of goes back, and first of all, probably a lot of you already seen Avengers Age of Ultron in theaters right now. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com to get your tickets now if you haven't seen it yet. Um, this was We kind of addressed a question that was like this on yesterday's show too about how much is out there. Look, it really doesn't bother me how much they show because even if they run like 20, 20 different trailers, right, you're probably going to see a grand total of about 10 minutes of footage in an otherwise 140-minute movie. Right. So... It, honestly, for me, and like I said yesterday, different strokes for different people, for me, doesn't bother me at all. Who makes these decisions? Uh, publicity and marketing at Disney makes these decisions mm -hmm. and what they want to do. And I personally think they have put out too much stuff. Not because I've seen too much, but because they've put out so much marketing material for Avengers. I feel, and I mentioned this yesterday too, that they might be crossing that line into, they're risking just turning people off, mm -hmm. getting people tired of it. Not because they're risking showing too much, but just because they put it in everybody's face far too much. So I, I don't think they needed it. I don't think they needed it. I don't think they needed <laughs> to market this movie. This is a movie that markets itself. I mean, it needs marketing, but it didn't need this much marketing. Mm -hmm. So I'm a little annoyed by how much they've done. They probably could have done it better and just pulled it back a bit. Do you think the marketing team is kind of going with the thought of, the super fans are going to see it no matter what. Mm. We're, we need to get those fans that are kind of just sitting at home watching Netflix and watching their TV. We need to get those those new audience members. So they're trying to show them as much as they can to try to like persuade them to try to come watch the well, movie. Well, I mean, you're, you're, you're hitting the nail on the head. Those These marketing campaigns are not made for the hardcore Avengers fans because right. those fans are coming to the movie regardless. Like I'm gonna, I'm one of those idiots. I'm gonna be. <laughs> you could, you could have run a three minute trailer of Joss Whedon scratching his bare ass with a twenty dollar. That would bill. have been actually really funny. And a lot been, of hits. Yes, a lot many, of hits. Many, many YouTube hits, <laughs> and I still would have gone to see the movie, and so would you. Don't lie. <laughs> um, but it, the, these marketing campaigns, they are targeted at those people who are not the hardcore fans. That's who they're trying to get. But it's those people that I'm worried you can turn off by getting it in their face too much. So who knows? Look, these people have marketing degrees. They know 10 times more about this than I do. But to me, from an outsider point of view, felt a little bit overboard. Okay. Matthew Pratt writes, greetings from the UK. Disney appears to be hitting all the right notes, bringing back the Star Wars saga. Based on the current positive buzz and excitement for the new film in December, do you have faith in Disney reviving the Indiana Jones franchise? Thanks, and I love the show. Um, well, I'm, as far as Disney hitting all the right notes, let's let's see the movie. <laughs> let's see Star Wars The Force Awakens before we proclaim it as hitting all the right notes. But they're certainly doing everything right so far. Um, so let's get that out of the way. Does the way Disney is doing Star Wars, would that give me confidence if they revive the Indiana Jones franchise? Can't answer that because so far I haven't seen anything. I haven't seen anything other than a trailer and a logo. That's it. That is not enough to give me confidence in them doing Indiana Jones. That being said, I, at this point, have no reason not to trust Disney. Look, they bought Marvel. And everybody was so worried about how, you know, all the Marvel films are all going to be little kid friendly now with Mickey Mouse jumping around and stuff like that. And they have made a marvelous cinematic universe that all of us are now dying to see each next film that comes out, you know. So they've done a great job with that. And then when they bought Star Wars, it was deja vu all over again. It was like, oh, now everything is going to be Darth Mouse and well, it's gonna all going to be. No, it won't be. The first few trailers come out, we're all excited about it. So 
I am willing at this point to give Disney the benefit of the doubt, even if it comes to an Indiana Jones franchise. I think we want to see Indiana Jones back. I'll be honest with you. I don't want to see another one with Harrison Ford. Uh, if they made another one with Harrison Ford, obviously mm -hmm. I'm there. I'm totally there. But I think it's time to kind of reset the franchise and let's get and get back. I say this all the time. Get back to the Nazis, damn it. To me, Indiana Jones, the Nazis are quintessentially important to Indiana Jones. Indy should be fighting Nazis. This is the only time it's okay to say that. That's the only time. I want Indy <laughs> fighting Nazis. That's that's his era. That's where he's like at his best, you know? So that's the Indy I want to see. And I, I'm confident that if Disney were to do it, they would. But once again, if they do decide to do another one with Indiana Jones, maybe now, I don't know, he's fighting Michael Jackson. Maybe that's it. Michael Jackson <laughs> turns out was actually secretly a Nazi and it was actually Harrison Ford that was like chasing him. I like where this is going. Yeah. I like yeah, yeah. Going. Everybody start writing this down. <laughs> um, but that's not the era I want to see Indiana Jones in. I want to see him back in that era, the World War II era. Right. What about Bradley Cooper or Ryan Gosling? Um, I would be very for either of those. Um, the other name that gets floated a lot about Indiana Jones is Chris Pratt. Mm -hmm. um, I would totally be down. Look, you get actors the caliber of a Chris Pratt, a Ryan Gosling, um, or Bradley a Bradley Cooper, um, then you're off to a good start. Yeah. <laughs> Any of them could do a magnificent job as Indiana Jones, so I'd be down for it. All right. Steve Kingsbury writes, Good morning from Kansas, John and crew. My question is about box office results in regards to Age of Ultron. It will most definitely be number one at least two weeks, but in week three, it comes against Mad Max Fury Road and week four, Tomorrowland. Do you think these two blockbuster films will have a significant impact on the numbers it eventually pulls in? And also, is there a chance, assuming it is good, it remains number one through its fourth week, beating both of the others in their opening weekend? Thanks and keep on keeping on. Yeah, I haven't seen the box office numbers yet, but I'm going to go out on a limb here. I'm going to make a very bold, bold prediction. I'm predicting that Avengers Age of Ultron will be the number one film at the box office this weekend. I believe it has the muscle to get past <laughs> Paul Blart Mall Cop 2. And I also believe it has the muscle to get past Furious 7 in its like sixth week. <laughs> Living so, on the edge. Going right out there on that <laughs> edge. Um, it will be the number one film again next week. But, I'm, but the, the Mad Max weekend... Because we talked about it in terms of Tomorrowland before, and we totally forgot about Mad Max mm -hmm. was coming out the week before. I am going to say Mad Max wins that weekend. If Mad Max was opening next weekend, Avengers kills it. If Mad Max was opening this weekend against Avengers, it becomes Mad Who. Mm -hmm. In its third week, with as good as the trailers to Mad Max have been and all the excitement that's being built for it, I think Mad Max can be number one at the box office in Avengers' third week. I think by that point, um, everybody who's who's really dying to see Avengers has seen it. Now you're operating on the audience is going back the second and third time. And at least I think on that weekend, a lot of them, instead of going back to see Avengers a third time, they might say, hey, I haven't seen Mad Max yet. Let's go see that first. Um, so I'm, I'm going to guess that Mad Max is number one at the box office in its third week. I also believe Tomorrowland will be number one the following week. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think Avengers will then hopscotch. I mean, Avengers may take over the number two spot in the fourth week over Mad Max, but I don't see it getting that number one spot again. So in, it, in, in this weekend, Avengers wins the box office. Next week, and Avengers wins the box office. The following weekend, Mad Max wins the box office. The following weekend after that, Tomorrowland. But we'll see how it shakes out. If I was releasing a movie, right. I would not want to release it next to near anywhere around Avengers. Why would they even, what positive thing could come out of them releasing their movie? Um, it's, it's, the, it's this whole premise of, here's a great example. I got a buddy of mine who recently, tired of the single life, has, has tried online dating, right? Oh, okay. Tinder? Took it to, uh, Grinder. I don't think it was Tinder. Tinder? Is Grinder. Oh, Grinder. I, I, I don't even know what Grinder is. It's too... You're in for a treat. Go okay, check it out. Okay, anyway. So, anyway. <laughs> um, and very apprehensive about trying online date. Tried it and had a great date. Not something he wanted to pursue a relationship with, but it was really fun and a great mm -hmm. date. So then he's like, that was great. I want to do that again. And he got another online okay. date and then had a couple and then eventually started dating, actually getting into a relationship with one of them. So oh. I think the same applies for the movies. I talk about this a lot is that when you are most likely to want to go to a movie after having a great experience at the movies. Totally. And I think 
that plays in the studios a lot. It's like, you know what? People are going to go see Age of Ultron. Probably they're going to have a really damn good time. They're going to be wanting, to, they're going to be thinking, we got to go back to the movies again soon. No problem, ma'am. Two weeks after Avengers Age of Ultron, here's Mad Max Fury Road. After that, Tomorrowland with George Clooney. And that's why you can get, like, everyone says you can't open big movies close to each other because neither of them make money. Then why do all the biggest movies open in the summer? Because in the summer, they, they release all these big, bombastic, great movies that people go to the movie theaters, have a great time, and they want to go back. So they go back to the next big movie that comes out. So there's, look, you don't want to open your movie against Avengers. Yeah. You don't want to open your movie <laughs> probably the immediate week prior or the immediate week after, but you want to get a little bit close to feed off that energy that it's going to cost. Same can be said of Star Wars, same can be said of a number yeah. of these big blockbuster movies that are coming out. I think there's a positive effect that a great movie going experience will make people want to go back. Yeah, more. that definitely makes sense. Meredith Ambling writes, Congratu congratulations on all the success recently. You won best online show across the 7 million monthly views mark. John got to run the Avengers press day, your interview with Paul Rudd and Michael Douglas, which I saw at the Avengers double feature, by the way. You guys are crushing it. Lots of YouTube channels start and fail. So let me ask you what you think are the three key things to your success where are so many others fail? Bring on the you know what. I'm gonna go on a limb and guess Meredith is a YouTuber. <laughs> so maybe, uh, maybe, you never know. Um, <laughs> thank you so much. And actually, you know, it's really funny. I put on my Facebook that a couple weeks ago we passed the seven million viewers. Mm. Per, we actually have already now passed the eight million viewers uh, per month thing. Yeah, uh, it's going crazy. <laughs> I attribute personally, if you can call anything that we've had as quote unquote success, I would attribute whatever success we've had to three different things. Number one, I talk about how great of a team we have. But I would actually say it's team chemistry. We, a lot of people write say, hey, do you guys actually like hang out? Do you guys actually all get along? You, I, I wish I could show you the <laughs> behind the scenes footage around here, which I cannot, nor will I ever. Don't lift up my arms. Don't lift up <laughs> Ashley's arms. And now everybody's going to wonder, what does that mean? You'll never know. You'll never know what that means. I wish I could show you like, and you know, before we start shooting, we're all hanging out. After we start shooting, we're all hanging out. You know, we finished shooting movie talk. We're all going out to lunch. Like we have, I, I love our team chemistry. And, and actually when we're bringing on new team members, like one of the things Dennis and I and, and Amy Rose has, have always talked about, like when, when bringing on new people, one of the items we want to look at is, how will they interact with everybody else? Like, not only are they great or are they knowledgeable? Are they going to camera? But almost as, as important as any of those is, do we think they're going to have really good chemistry with, with the rest of the team? And I just think our chemistry is so great. And we have, I think part of the reason we're able to do the things we do is because we all really enjoy doing things together. Why do we watch movies at 12 o'clock at night and shoot r reviews at 1 30 in the morning together? Cause we actually, we legitimately like doing all the stuff together. We like hanging out together and doing the stuff together. So I'm going to say team chemistry is number one. Number two is the diversity in our programming. This has been growing is, you know, you know, you want the biggest movie news of the biggest uh, items AMC movie talk every day, but are you into indie film? No problem. We got AMC indie spotlight for you. Uh, are you into, <clears throat> you like talking about classic cinema? No problem. We got AMC rewind for you. Are you into, you love star Wars. We got AMC Jedi council. You love your comic book movies. we got AMC heroes. You like talking about movies that are opening this week, like from the small to the big, no problem. We got AMC coming soon. You like just having fan interaction. No problem. We got AMC mailbag. And that's why we like yesterday's show. We're talking about Bollywood and we're talking, mm -hmm. we're looking at other things as well. Probably do a show based on Latino film, probably at some point too. Um, and so I think the diversity of our programming is one of the things that's, that's also uh, has helped our success. The other, uh, the third thing, though is and this is gonna sound like pandering but it's not we have the best fans in the online space we have amazing fans in the online space because we have never had a marketing budget for amc movie news amc movie news has only grown because people who watch amc movie news have become our evangelists like they've gone out and they've shared our videos on their facebook page and their twitters and they're they're writing messages hey and, and tagging people you gotta check out this show they have been the people most responsible for growth of AMC. So I would say the three, if I were to pick three reasons, but there's probably about a dozen or more, is we have really good team chemistry, we have diversity of our programming, and we have the best viewers and fans in the world. And you guys are, and you're the reason we've had any of this. So that's Aww. what I would say the three things are. There you have it, Meredith. <laughs>
There you have it. Thomas Begman writes, Hey, AMC, I love the show. My question is about the zombie movie genre and where you think it is and where do you think it's going? There are many great zombie movies, Night of the Living Dead, Dawn of the Dead, Dawn of the Dead remake, 28 Days Later, and basically anything George Romero has done. Do you think we could see a return of the indie-style zombie movies instead of the big Hollywood CGI fest? Or do you think because of the big Hollywood movies that indie filmmakers are afraid of being seen as just another zombie movie? Schnepp, please make a zombie movie. <laughs> Schnepp would make a really interesting yeah, zombie right? movie. I'll be on. Okay, so where do I see the zombie movie genre now? Where do I see it going? Okay, where I see the jo- z- zombie genre movies uh, right now is that they're movies that uh, inexplicably an outbreak of some kind is sweeping across the globe, uh, turning people into marching undead. That if they bite the living, at some point you're going to die and come back as a zombie in which you will also become a flesh-eating person. There's going to be a band of survivors somewhere that are on the run and trying to figure out a way to survive and maybe in some occasions try to find a way to to cure what's going on in the world. Where do I see the zombie genre going? I see an outbreak of some kind spreading (laughs) out, crossing the globe. I see these walking undead who if they bite you, at some point you're going to die and come back as a zombie. They'll feed in your flesh. There's going to be a band of survivors that are running around trying to survive and maybe they'll try to find a cure. I'm tired of the zombie genre. I'm sorry. I know it's sacrilegious to say it, but I got to be honest. I'm bored of zombie Mm -hmm. stuff. That's not to say that a zombie thing can't pop up and have it be surprisingly refreshing. I liked Warm Bodies. Mm-hmm. I thought Warm Bodies was a really cool, different kind of take on the zombie genre. I was, I surprisingly, I became a fan of World War Z. I thought that was a, a refreshingly different take, although all the core elements of what the zombie genre is were still there. Um, so, look, the zombie genre, though, is, you know, like like a really bad relationship you had it sticks with you forever there is just always going to be around there will always be genre uh, zombie movies around and once in a while a really good one will knock it out of the park even though it's the same formula um I, so i don't see the zombie the zombie genre going anywhere i just gotta admit and confess i'm not a fan of it even though i'm pleasantly surprised once in a while i don't know why this just popped into my head but would you consider cabin fever like a zombie movie you know it's, it's a question that comes up too about 28 days later like mm-hmm. technically, mm-hmm. technically speaking, John, it's not, 28 Days Later is not a zombie movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a zombie movie, though. Mm-hmm. I mean, so it's totally the same. Yeah. That's a great question. I don't know. I've never had anybody I really ask me like that. I like Cabin Fever. What do you I, think what, of would it? you Would you consider it that? Um, I mean, I'll have to rewatch it again. I saw it so long ago. But I, I remember I really, really liked it. I don't know if I... When I think of zombie movie, I think of more of like, uh, people walking around. Kind of like right. around that. So I don't think I would consider it a, a zombie movie. All right, what's next? Oliver Cook writes, Hey, AMC crew, I watch you every day and I'm loving Phase 3. With the Tyson biopic on the way and Martin Scorsese attached to many other films like The Irishman, I was wondering about the Sinatra biopic. I'm a big Frank Sinatra fan and he has such an interesting story. I know a screenplay is apparently being written. However, with this Tyson news, as excited as I am, I can't help but be disappointed that it seems a bit unrealistic now. Marty is 72 years young. Fly me to the moon. I love Frankie. Frankie's awesome. (laughs) Um, Okay, regarding Scorsese's age, he's 72, yes. Clint Eastwood is 85 and just got nominated for Best Director at the Academy Awards. Uh, woo, actually, fact checker, um, Dennis, can you look up? I thought he got to, he, maybe he didn't get nominated for Best Director. Uh, can you check to see if Clint Eastwood was just nominated? Just cut in and interrupt me when you find the answer to that. But even if he didn't get nominated for Best Director, his film got nominated for Best Film mm. and the actor he directed got nominated for Best Actor. So... It's, we, we're not asking Martin Scorsese to be the guy to carry the lights on the film screen. He's 72. Irrelevant. Mm-hmm. Totally irrelevant. Don't worry about Marty's age whatsoever. <laughs> He'll, he's just fine. Um, have you, were you able to find that, Dennis? Yeah, he didn't, he didn't uh, get nominated for uh, Best Director. Okay, that's right. He was one of the guys who didn't. But, uh, like I said, his film got nominated for Best Picture. The actor he he directed got nominated for Best Actor. So don't worry about it. If he can do that at 85, Martin Scorsese mm-hmm. can do it at 75, at 77, mm-hmm. 79. doesn't matter. The last I heard about it was back in early 2014 where Marty said, no, no, I'm still working on a Sinatra biopic. Well, we're a year past that now. It, if you go to his IMDb page, not that IMDb is authoritative, 
But if you go to his IMDb page, it still lists Sinatra as one of his upcoming projects, but it's got a couple more before then. So will he ever get around to this Sinatra biopic? I honestly don't know. I got a feeling not. I hope he does. I totally hope he does. I, I just, if I had to put money on it right now, which I'm glad that I don't, I would say no, but I hope it happens. It will be your dream biopic. Dream biopic. I'm looking forward to a really good Jim Henson biopic. Okay. Seriously, not just because I love the Muppets, but when you look at Jim Henson's life and and the lives he influenced, who among us didn't watch either as children the Muppets or Sesame Street or like we were all touched by that. Oh, yeah. And when you really look into his life, the man was fascinating. And and even after his death, I mean, his legacy just continues. I would, I've said for a long time, I would love a Jim Henson mm -hmm. biopic. Don't blame you. Amelia N writes, with outstanding supporting cast of the live action Beauty and the Beast, mostly being non-human characters, I was wondering how exactly they are going to be portrayed on screen. Will they be voicing CGI objects, a combination of CGI and motion capture or something else? Thanks for everything you do. Well, I don't think you're going to see Ian McKellen in a big candlestick costume <laughs> going, be our guest be our guest. I, I mean, I don't see that happening. I'd love yet. that though. That would be interesting though <laughs> with gold makeup on his face. And, <laughs> yeah. No, it's not going to. I have a feeling though, you you said it yourself in the question, I think it's where we're going to see is motion capture. I think we're going to see motion capture. I think they're going to get the actors to do their own motion capture. I think it'd be really cool actually seeing Ian McKellen do his own motion mm -hmm. capture um, and they're going to voice it. But don't forget too, there, there comes, spoiler alert to Beating the Beast, there comes a point we may see flashbacks of these characters before the curse takes place. And then we're going to see them later in the film too, after the curse is broken. So we're going to see Ian McKellen. We're going to see Ewan McGregor. We're going to see all these actors in their full garbs too. But for the time when they are the clock and the times that they are the candlestick and whatever, I I believe we're going to see CGI with really good motion capture. That's how I think they're going to play it out. And Disney's just on this, you know, a live action kick with the Mulan movie and stuff coming out. Yeah. What movie next? Aladdin. Say it. Say it. Hard to say because, <laughs> wow, who does the genie? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Now, so Aladdin true. So true. is so – we were talking about this a few weeks ago. Yeah. The, the reason Aladdin is such a great idea – is because that story is so sweepingly cinematic. Mm -hmm. Just think about it. I mean, even like that opening song, Arabian Night. Oh, yeah. You know? <laughs> and then it all comes down to who plays the genie. Mm -hmm. Some people have this very romantic but very bad idea that take all the original footage and voice recordings of, of uh, Robin Williams and just build the movie around his voice recordings. Yeah. That's not the way to do a good movie. You you do what's best for the movie. You don't do what's best for an idea. Right. And although there's something very romantic and, yeah. and, and appropriate about the idea of let's still build it around Robin Williams, then it's no longer Aladdin. Now mm -hmm. it's that project where we're going to try something really different by taking these old recordings. You know, I, I just don't think that works. So Aladdin, sure, but holy crap, it becomes all about who do you get totally. to be genie. I mean, it, it's all about that. Maybe Nathan Lane would be an interesting choice. Um, I, I I don't know. James Earl Jones. James Earl Jones is the voice of Genie. Very, very different Genie than what we're used to. All right. Amy H. writes, Hey, AMC, ever since I started watching your channel, I've been addicted. So my question is, do critics sometimes tend to be non-objective or be too harsh in a movie or cut a movie some slack because I've just seen Age of Ultron and I was surprised that it had a low rating on some websites, though I think it's awesome. And the opposite of Furious 7, which I thought was good, but definitely not as good as AOU. Here's the thing. Oh, First of all, Age of Ultron, make no mistake, it's awesome. Mm -hmm. Age of Ultron is awesome. It's a great movie. Good thing movie. you saw it three weeks ago. Yeah, I saw it. Common weeks folk are just seeing it today. I've seen it a couple of times. Um, the Age of Ultron is awesome. And I am flat, you know, I read some, some colleagues of mine, some reviews, right? Mm -hmm. Who they would go through and review it, and it's like, it does this great, and 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 then I get to the end of the review, but you know, it just doesn't quite match up to the first one, and they give it a, a negative review. <laughs> it's like, you just, you, you just talked this whole thing about how it does all these things so awesome, but because to you it wasn't as good as the first one, it gets a negative review? That I don't understand. I don't understand that mentality. Guess what? X-Men Days of Future Past is not as good as the first Avengers movie. But it's awesome. It didn't have to be as good as Avengers Age of All or of the first Avengers movie to be a great movie. 
Why does Avengers Age of Ultron need to be better than the first Avengers in order to be considered a good movie? Seriously, I, I have read, look, all movies are subjective. I've read some reviews that actually just didn't like the movie. Fair enough. But it's like, I have read a number of them from my colleagues who it's like, if you just read parts of the review, you think, oh, clearly they love this movie. But then it's, but it didn't do this part as well as the first one. And it didn't do this as well as the first Avenger. Negative <laughs> review. <laughs> What the hell are you thinking? <laughs> that is the most, that is the stupidest bit of rationale ever. I mean, I, I just don't, dread. now, but that being said, getting to your question, I have also read not just about Avengers Age of Ultron, but a lot of other movies where they say, you know, hey, I saw this movie and I really liked it. Critics who are giving a negative review are being overly critical. <laughs> well, no, they just didn't like a movie that you liked. I mean, couldn't we say that of you too? That if you say there's a movie you don't like, can I then say to you, well, you're just being too critical. The only difference is you're right. I mean, that, we're all like that, right? Mm -hmm. The difference between all those critics and me is that I'm right. We all think that way. Right. All of us, every single one of us on this stinking planet. We all think that, yeah, they think that and they think that, but I'm right. So if I don't like this movie and you do, then you're biased for it. If I do like that movie and you don't, you're just being overly critical. You know, and, and so that's kind of what we do. So I'd say transcend yourself above that, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. It's hard though, it's natural for us. Yeah. I do it, you do it, we all do it. But I would say cut critics a little bit of slack. While there are some of them that I just gave a hard time to because they're like, <laughs> oh yeah, this movie's great, but it's not just the first one, negative review, it's stupid. Um, but, but, but don't discount that some people are gonna look at a, any type of movie, no matter how good or bad, and say, hey, I really like that, or hey, I didn't, and they're neither right nor wrong compared to yours. It's just what they thought. I always think it's interesting when there's a huge gap between the critic rating and then the fan rating. Right. How, does that, how does that happen? Well, it's actually much rarer than people make it out to mm -hmm. be. It's actually much rarer. Usually, the critic rating and the fan rating are usually within about 15 to 20% of mm -hmm. each other. Out of a scope of 100, that's actually pretty close. But you have to remember this too. I brought this up maybe a couple of months ago. When you're getting critic rating or fan ratings, right? You are getting a rating. Let's say Paul Blart too, right? Mm -hmm. You are getting a fan rating of people who saw the trailers to Paul Blart or knew what Paul Blart was and thought, hey, you know what? I like the first one or whatever. I want to see that. So you are getting the ratings of a group of people who are predisposed to wanting to like that film. And, that, and nothing wrong with that. That's the way it is. With groups of critics, you are getting people seeing that movie who do want to see it, people who don't want to see it, people who don't care about it, people who are indifferent about it, blah, blah, blah. You are getting a much wider uh, view of the spectrum of, of a sample size of people seeing a movie than just the fans because the fans is like, man, I can already tell the movie's going to suck. They're not going to go and pay $9 mm -hmm. to go and see it. So what you're doing is you're sampling people coming out of theater who thought that that looked good enough that I'm predisposed that I think I'm going to like this. I'll pay 9 bucks and go and see it. So I think sometimes we overestimate how often there's a gap between critics and, mm -hmm. and, and, the, uh, and the fans. And then sometimes you got to just write it off to that the critics was all people who did and didn't want to see the movie. And the people, the fans, are all people who wanted to see the movie. And so you got to keep that in consideration when you're trying to figure out why is there yeah. a discrepancy there. Definitely makes sense. All right, that is the last one for today. Woo! Woo! Time for us to segue on out of here. You get it? Paul Blart, segue. Oh, that was clever. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us, guys. Um, head over to www.amctheaters.com for all of your theaters, showtimes, and ticket information. And if you want a podcast version of this episode, check out the description box below and make sure to click that subscribe button. Thanks to the guys in the room, Dennis and Jonathan. And thanks to John. John, where can people find you online? You guys can find me online on Facebook and on Twitter, simply at John Campia. And you guys can find me on Twitter and on Instagram at Ashley Mova. Thanks again so much for joining us, guys, and we'll catch you next time. Bye.